hello to all the comrades around the world. So um, I'll start with a, a quote I'm sure you've all heard that, and, and this is from Lenin, without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Um, a revolutionary party absolutely needs a philosophy and the ruling class certainly have their philosophy. They see this system as the most natural system, as something unchangeable. They are, they are empiricists. They, they, they see this system as an established fact and they conclude thus it is and thus it shall always be. But as their system decays, the ruling class is increasingly racked with anxiety. They can only imagine one reality, this reality, this capitalist system. And so they turn away from the real world and the truths it reveals about their system. And in turn, they infect the whole of society with their moods of mysticism and despair. And we know that they control the schools, the universities, the newspapers and the scientific journals. And through these channels, their mysticism and their empirical outlook seep into society and their philosophical outlook takes on the dimensions of popular prejudices. Now, in our struggle against the capitalist class, they have an undeniable advantage in their resources. But they also suffer from one insurmountable disadvantage, and that's that at each turn in the situation, all the claims that they and their apologists make about the world, they conflict with reality and with the experience of that reality that workers and other classes in society go through. They're in conflict with the truth itself. And for that reason, their philosophy is contradicted at every stage by new discoveries in the natural sciences. And conversely, our philosophy, dialectical materialism, as, as Tash explained, it finds some of its highest and most exquisite confirmations also in the discoveries of the natural sciences. Now, as Tash explained again in, in the, the very good introduction, dialectics at bottom is a philosophy of change, of how change is intrinsic to nature and society. And um, the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus actually summed it up quite beautifully with an aphorism many millennia ago, when he said that everything both is and is not, for everything is in flux. And this is a fascinating idea because how can everything both be and not be? A chair is a chair, a person is a person, and as far as common sense is concerned, that's the end of the matter. But reality isn't so simple. Let's take the apparently simple idea that a person is a person. Well, the cells lining your stomach are replaced every five days. Your skin cells are replaced roughly every one to th uh, three to four weeks, sorry. Uh, the, the cells in your bones take roughly a decade to, to be replaced. And only a few parts of your body are not replaced at all. Your teeth will stay with you if you look after them until you die. But over the course of a few months or years, most of the matter in your body will have been replaced by new matter. So if I ask you in a few years time, am I the same person who gave that lead off at IMU 2022? You would have to answer both yes and no, in a sense, in defiance of common sense. And here is precisely where the philosophy of common sense, or to give it its actual name, formal logic, its, 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 its proper name, this is where it completely fails us when dealing with drawn out processes, when dealing with change. And even in the moment, you think a person is a static thing. But biologists understand that appearances are very deceptive because this apparent equilibrium is the product of a dynamic tension going on within each of and all of our bodies. I'll give you one example. My blood sugar level is static within strict limits. And that's a good thing, too. Otherwise, I'd be in a lot of medical trouble. But this uh, relative equilibrium is caused by the effect of two, the, the, the contradictory effects of two hormones. They're both produced in the pancreas. One of them is called glucagon. It's released when, uh, when my blood sugar drops and it causes my cells to release glucose into the bloodstream. The other is called insulin and it's, uh, it's released when my blood sugar level is elevated, such as after a large meal. And it, it causes my body to take up glucose from the bloodstream. So this apparent stasis is the product of a dynamic tension of a contradictory of contradictory active processes that are also and, and other processes are at, uh, are at play in other uh, parts of maintaining homeostasis. I've used um, I've used examples from biology from my own bio biology uh, so far, but uh, anywhere that we look in nature, um, we can see the same thing. We can see how the interpenetration of opposing contradictory forces in tension with each other is intrinsic to the natural world. Uh, the atom is a unity of, of positively charged protons in the nucleus and negatively charged electrons in, uh, in the shells orbiting them. And enormous amounts of energy can be stored up in these or orbits um, that is not immediately apparent to the senses. Methane gas, for example, is completely uh, odorless and it's completely colorless. But if it reaches the right concentrations in the presence of oxygen, a, a tiny spark can set off uh, an enormous explosion. 
and that that unperceived energy stored in those electron orbits is is very is suddenly released. We can look at the at the astrophysical level um, at the, the the stars in the sky. They seemed, and for millennia, people thought they were completely unchanging. We talk about the fixed stars, and our closest star, the sun, um, shines with an apparently constant intensity, day to day, year to year. But appearances are deceptive. Today, it appears stable because of two contradictory forces. Gravity is constantly trying to make our, our sun collapse in on itself. And on the other hand, you have heat pressure generated by the fusion of light elements into heavier elements, constantly pushing back against that gravitational collapse. And it might appear that nothing much is, is, uh, is happening uh, in, this, in this constant battle between these forces. But in 5 billion years, we'll find out that a lot has been going on beneath the surface. Because the, 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 the process of hydrogen fusion will come to an end as there it ceases to be sufficient hydrogen to fuse. And that dynamic equilibrium will be utterly disrupted. And what is a blink of an eye in astrophysical terms, uh, all of the inner planets, possibly including the Earth, will be consumed as the sun suddenly expands. The main point I'm making is that at every level, motion is the mode of existence of matter, but that this motion is, is often hidden beneath the surface. Heraclitus says nature likes to hide, but unperceived beneath that surface, a quantitative accumulation of, of invisible changes or, or apparently invisible changes can prepare the way for that dramatic qualitative leaps. And the essence of science is to, to, to tear back the, the, the veil from, from nature and to look beneath that surface. And I should add that that is the role of Marxists in our own way as well. That, you know, the regular apologists of capitalism, they regularly challenge us, look, the working class hasn't moved for 40 years. They will never move. What are you wasting your time for? They are empiricists. They worship the, the, the established so-called fact. And they disdain all theory that goes beyond this supposed fact. But what are thought of as facts always contain some element of interpretation, actually. Um, Hegel answered these empir empiricists a long time ago when he said the following. The fact is misshaped by the reflection that is incapable of grasping it. They don't understand what this fact is trying to tell them. So when the workers finally do begin to move, when revolutions do erupt despite their predictions, they are left in shock at the apparent outbreak of anarchy, as they call it. And the reason they, they, they call revolutions anarchy, because it always seems that a revolution is an outbreak of chaos or disorder to the ruling class. And that's because they don't understand that there is an order, there is a deeper causality, which makes revolutions not just possible, but inevitable at a certain stage. Now, um, I'm going to move on a little bit now. So uh, this being um, a session on science, I thought it would be appropriate to do a short pop quiz. I promise this to some comrades. Does any comrade know what the 13th element to be discovered was? And it was the first in the modern age. If, if you're at a watch party, you can shout it out. <laughs> uh, it was, of course, phosphorus. Uh, but I wonder how many comrades know how phosphorus was discovered. Well, in the, in the 17th century, as we know, um, capitalism was just emerging in Europe. There was a huge thirst for gold. Uh, we had a session yesterday on how the Spanish conquistadors were uh, driven across the Atlantic Sea in search of this gold but others looked in a lot stranger places for the same thing. Alchemy became all the rage within Europe as, uh, as, as, as experimenters tried to turn everyday substances into gold. And uh, one German alchemist had a brilliant idea. He realized that urine is kind of gold colored. <laughs> so, so he decided to condense down huge quantities of urine to see what he got. It must have been a, an incredibly unpleasant experience because it took him 1,100 liters of urine to end up with 60 grams of this powdery substance. And of course, he wasn't left with gold, but he was left with phosphorus. I think it's um, a fun example, perhaps, of how uh, uh, science can advance under, under the pressures of other factors than intellectual interests alone. It, it's also a good example of, uh, of how science can be done, uh, good science can be done with uh, very bad hypotheses. But this, this stage was a stage that most all of the sciences went through of collecting facts, collecting data before we could draw out the necessity which binds all of those facts, all of that data together. And it was breakthroughs like these, isolating the elements that laid the basis for a revolution in chemistry in the 19th century. When the, uh, the Russian chemist Mendeleev uncovered the periodic table, which I'm sure you've all seen at school. But I don't know if comrades have considered what a tremendous confirmation this periodic table is of the dialectical method. Because the, the periodic table is not just a list of elements lined up quantitatively by atomic weight or atomic number. It does that, but it links these quantities up to repeating qualitative features within the elements. 
as nuclei get bigger and bigger, the same you have the same periodic recurrence of the same qualities. Uh, you have the soft, highly reactive alkaline metals, the colorful oxides of the transition metals, and so on and so forth. And at each stage, you have this periodic process of negation of the negation. But eventually, a tipping point is reached when nuclei get to a certain size. The, the, the short-range attraction of protons and neutrons within the nucleus and the long-range um, rep electrostatic repulsion of protons away from each other within the same nuclei, they cease to balance. And quantity transforms into quality. You have a new class of elements from roughly atomic number 84, which, which only have unstable radioactive isotopes. We enter the realm of, of radiochemistry. And as with chemistry, moving on a little bit, Likewise, in biology, it was necessary to go through a whole process of collecting facts before the necessity could really be drawn out in nature. Numerous species had to be categorized by kingdom, order, genus, before any relationship between them could be, uh, could be established. And uh, a particularly uh, large contribution in this respect was, uh, was, was made by the Swedish taxonomist, uh, Carl Linnaeus. But on, on the basis of collecting all of this, all of this data, all of this information, you, a, a genius of the stature of Darwin, standing upon the shoulder of other giants that came before, could really bring out the real relationships between species in biology. And com comrades know, his, 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 um, his advances showed that species are far from these fixed static things in themselves. Rather, they flow into one another. They're in a permanent process of change. And a result of this is the fact that species, uh, biology abounds with species that, that defy categorization into fixed static categories. So in, in, in our oceans, 60% of the amoeba-like plankton in the ocean are called uh, mixotrophs, if I've got that name correctly. <laughs> and that's because they, they literally um, mix photosynthesis, that is taking light from the sun like a plant, with gobbling up and eating other plankton like an animal. Are they plants or animals? That's a, a bit arbitrary, whichever you say. The Archaeopteryx um, is, a, is a celebrated fossil because it's, uh, it, it shares certain features with the non-avian theropod dinosaurs, but it also shares some with uh, modern birds. Um, viruses um, def defy you to answer the question, is this a living thing or is this, in or is, is this organic or inorganic? They reproduce like life, but they don't metabolize uh, uh, like life. They, they are uh, entirely dependent upon other cells. And the reason that species so often defy our attempts to categorize them um, is because they are always literally in transition. In every moment, they are ceasing to be what they once were, and they are becoming something that they are not. The law of identity breaks down. We have difference within identity, which is uh, core to Darwin's discovery. Because within populations of any species, we see all kinds of quantitative variation. Um, a butterfly's wings could be a shade lighter or darker, or a lion's claws could be a little sharper or a little, a little longer. And Darwin showed how all that was necessary was the accumulation of these quantitative changes under the pressure of natural selection to explain the qualitative distinctions between species. The accumulation of this quantitative change reaches a, a tipping point. Quantity transforms into quality. A population can no longer in, interbreed with another population and they, they form distinct species. We, we take this idea for granted, of course, but um, this, this, this hasn't always been immediately apparent. Um, for millennia, um, the thought of human beings has been dominated by creation myths. And Darwin's discoveries were, uh, were a scandal to uh, a respectable uh, middle-class Christian Victorian England. I should say, um, Darwin, of course, he, he also had his, uh, he had his weak side. He was a product of his time. And he, he conceived of change um, as a slow, gradual process, which reflected really the, um, uh, the fact that Vic the Victorian middle classes were, were allergic to the idea of, uh, of leaps in nature or in society, of course. But the, um, the problem Darwin faced is that the, the fossil record doesn't really bear this idea out or it, or it poses a problem because throughout the fossil record, we, we are struck by the number of missing links that exist between species. Now for, for Darwin, he, um, he was inclined to explain these missing links as, a, as an artifact of the patchy way in which remains are fossilized. And this question of uh, these missing links dogged paleontology until well into the 20th century. 
But I'll repeat that phrase by Hegel. The facts are misshapen by a reflection that is incapable of grasping them. Because the, the facts weren't pointing to uh, uh, simple problems with uh, preservation. The facts were pointing to the whole way that evolution unfolds is not gradualistic at all. The gaps in the fossil record reflect the fact that evolution has taken place by sudden bursts, leaving very little evidence of the, the rapid uh, periods of, of, of speciation. And this secret was really unlocked by two paleontologists in the 1970s, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. Eldridge uh, examined um, trilobite fossils, which can be found in fossil beds from all the world's oceans dating back 550 million years, until they suddenly went extinct about 250 million years ago uh, during the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. And studying these, Gould and Eldridge realized that for most of their history, actually, species are relatively stable. Fossils are pretty much the same through entire geological strata. But of course, quantitative change does take place in the environment, in other species in the ecosystem, in, in, uh, in the genes of, of these species. And this accumulation at a certain point leads to a situation where this equilibrium is, is suddenly punctuated by rapid bursts of evolution. New adaptations suddenly emerge. Species are wiped out. Entire groups of species go extinct. And new species rapidly take their place. Or, and, and, and entire biological families that lived in the dark suddenly radiate out to fill every uh, ecological niche available, as our ancestors did after the, de uh, the, the demise of the dinosaurs. This idea was, uh, was named punctuated equilibrium by, uh, by Gould and Elridge. And it's a feature actually of the whole of nature, not just biology. Uh, a century and a half before Gould, um, Hegel came up with another name for it. He referred to it as the nodal line of development. Uh, long periods of apparent stasis or equilibrium in which quantitative change builds up are rapidly punctuated by qualitative leaps, catastrophes, phase changes, to use the physics expression. Out of a simple mixture of hydrogen and helium gas, stars condense until a tipping point is reached. They reach a temperature where they suddenly ignite into life. Fusion takes place. In their interior, light nuclei are fused into heavier nuclei and a period of, of equilibrium sets in, slow quantitative change. Billions of years may pass before this quantitative change lays the basis for a new catastrophe, a new qualitative leap. In the, in the largest stars, uh, heavy elements are cast out in tremendous explosions called supernovae, and the process starts again. It's, it seems we've gone back to the starting point, but that's not the case because you have a new mixture of elements with much more greatly enriched by, by larger complex elements. A new beginning doesn't symbolize a return to the starting point. In the dusty disks surrounding the new generation of stars, Planets are formed which are richer in heavy elements. The Earth itself began as a probably a hot molten ball of magma, but it, uh, it slowly cooled. And uh, as it cooled, it dissipated large amounts of, uh, of disordered en energy into, into space. That, that, that energy has been, has been lost forever as, uh, in complete disorder. But the other side of that dissipation, that growing disorder of that energy into space, is the, uh, the cooling of the planet to the point where complex chemistry suddenly emerged. Chaos and order form two sides of this same process. And in our planet's early atmosphere, complex amino acids started to be formed and, and an increasingly complex chemistry reached a tipping point in turn when DNA and RNA began being formed for the first time. Uh, chemistry stood at the cusp of a new revolution, the, the birth of life. And with the emergence of, of life for billions of years, again, simple celled organisms were, were all that existed, apparent stasis set in. And then 550 million years, of course, um, an explosion of an array of complex multicellular life burst onto the scene during the Cambrian explosion. And throughout this process, um, which has stretched back over billions and billions of years, matter has organized from the lower to the higher, from, from lighter to heavier elements, Eventually, chemistry emerged, and it in turn became more and more complex. And of course, life, which in turn has become increasingly complex, until finally, in the in the human brain, it has reached matter has reached its most complex form of organization that we're yet aware of in the universe. And uh, matter has has finally become conscious of itself. And this this hasn't been a, a smooth process. It's been uh, there's been sudden throwbacks. Stars have died. Enormous lava flows interrupt the progress of life. 
But nevertheless, with all of these setbacks, there has been a clear trend to history. Uh, matter evolving, becoming more complex until finally thought emerges. And, and these discoveries um, about, about the, the history of, of, of this, this universe have marvelously um, confirmed the dialectical view of nature. But they've also confirmed the, uh, the materialist view of nature, that matter is primary and mind is just an emergent property of the human brain, of matter organized in the human brain. But most scientists don't have a conscious philosophy. And science is as prone as any other field of human thinking to the, the ideological trend of creeping mysticism evident in the rest of society. Now, dialectics explains, as we've discussed, that the world is one interconnected whole. It's constantly developing. But as we, as we discussed in chemistry and biology, for, for, for science to really progress, it's also necessary for scientists to break down nature precisely into its constituent parts. And for the pioneers of physics as well, it was necessary to, to imagine isolated systems in the physical world. You know, a point, like, uh, a point like object falling through space without air resistance, or a perfect sphere sliding down a, a frictionless incline, the sort of things you never find in nature, of course. But in order to get to the, uh, the essence of things, this was uh, an absolutely vital method, approach. You know, scientists had to abstract from nature, from nature to, to, to isolate its different parts. They absolutely have to discard what is non-essential in order to grasp precisely what is essential. But you'll run into philosophical problems if you forget to put nature back together again. If you forget that our models of nature are only approximations of nature imperfect approximations. So in the 18th century, um, mechanics made tremendous advances culminating in the discoveries of Isaac Newton. But for many, his mechanics became um, of, of, of isolated, simple systems, became a blueprint for an entire worldview. Thinkers started seeing everything as nothing more than the, the, than the sum of its inert mechanical parts. These parts moving along straight line trajectories through perfect geometrical space until they're deflected by uh, physical contact, by mechanical contact with other bodies. It's a, it's a worldview which uh, conceives of the world as something like a piece of clockwork, basically. The planets and the stars that we see continue their orbits for all eternity without deflection. And the Earth as we see it has existed for all eternity, pretty much uh, moving through its motion. It's literally going through the motions of a mechanism for all eternity without much historical change. All that was, uh, was needed, basically, was uh, a prime mover, uh, a clockmaker, to set this whole thing in motion. God, basically, as Newton believed. Um, but after, uh, after that act of creation, um, Newton's laws could describe the whole workings of reality for all eternity. And it was, it was a very popular view that, basically, um, Newton had, had, had finished putting the last dot and comma on physics. Physics was closed, a closed book after Newton. He completed it. Of course, advances in, in quantum mechanics uh, at the scale of the very small and uh, advances, uh, discoveries in relativity by Einstein at the scale of the very fast and the very large. Uh, they've obviously exploded this idea. It's, uh, it was an illusion. But it's a repeating illusion that we see in many ages, including our own, that we're on the cusp of knowing everything that can be known about the universe. But, but taken, to their, um, taken to their extreme, um, all ideas break down, they have their limits, they push up against those limits, and they turn into absurdities. Thomas Kuhn uh, explained this brilliantly in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which I recommend to comrades, it's well worth a read. We have a theory of, the, of, of, of how things work, but uh, new observations accumulate, particularly, particularly um, you know, at the edges of our knowledge. And, and we can, perhaps for a very long time, um, fit these observations into the old theory. But repeatedly, we see the accumulation of new observations weighs down upon the old theory until a crisis erupts and the way is prepared for a scientific revolution. But when a revolution takes place, um, the old view isn't completely discarded. We just need to take Newton's laws. They still have a huge range of applicability and they're still taught in schools for that reason. But the, the rational kernel of those ideas has been subsumed into a higher, richer view of reality. Now, Thomas Kuhn, who, who described this uh, process of scientific development, was, was not a Marxist by any stretch of the imagination. But I think it remains a remarkable demonstration of, uh, of the operation of dialectics in the history of human thinking itself and of science. Now, we should not flatter ourselves that living in this modern world, that we, have, uh, that we are in any way immune 
to the philosophical errors of earlier generations. As I've said before, scientists don't have their own conscious philosophy for the most part. And the same moods of mysticism that emanate from the capitalist class uh, also seep into the sciences. And today, theoretical physics abounds with all sorts of mystical nonsense. It's, it's a fact. You only have to open the, the pages of the New Scientist magazine to, to convince yourself of this fact. Uh, it is a popular science magazine, but they do a good job of collecting the, uh, the, the, the idealist nonsense from the, that, that comes from mainstream physics. You have uh, theories of everything, or God equations, as some people prefer to, call, prefer to call them. Finished mathematical abstractions that are meant to def uh, define all of the laws of nature, just as previous generations attempted to do. You have untestable ideas like, like string theory, multiple new dimensions, and multiverses are invoked willy-nilly. And, and there is a real tendency in which uh, um, it's, it's no longer observations and uh, measurements which justify the theory, but the elegance of the complex mathematics deployed in the theory itself. We could describe it as a kind of mathematical idealism which is being revived at the heart of the sciences. Now, mathematics, of course, deals with, um, deals with a very high level of abstraction. It's, it's the science of pure quantity when we strip every other quality away from nature. But the act of abstracting all of the qualities from nature doesn't make the truths of mathematics any less dependent upon the material world, just like any other science. And its, it's material origins are, um, are plainly evident, even in the languages, uh, even in the language and, and this sort of stuff that we use. You know, the fact that we have a number system with a base of 10 is, a, is simply down to the fact that we happen to have uh, 10 digits on our, on our, on our hands. And our ancestors, just like a child does today, would have convinced themselves that two plus two equals four by, by counting the digits on, on their hands. The words geometry um, translates literally as earth measurement, reflecting its origins precisely in the measurement of the physical earth. And yet despite these, 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 uh, these origins that mathematics has, the fact uh, that mathematics has its roots in the material world is regularly forgotten. You can go back to, to Pythagoras and uh, the Pythagoreans who believed that mathematics has some sort of divine origin uh, separate from this material world. And idealist uh, notions of mathematics dominate right down to the present day. But in my opinion, perhaps the starkest expression of a mystical revival within the sciences is the fact that cosmology has arrived at a fully fledged creation myth. I'm, I'm of course talking about the, uh, the Big Bang theory uh, which states that space, time, the universe, and everything within the universe was created within an instant uh, roughly 13.8 billion years ago. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware that it is a controversial thing for, uh, for us to, to, to question um, cosmology, because it is, of course, a, an accepted truth amongst most cosmologists. But I will say this, the truth is never established by consensus. Now, for materialists, to say that uh, matter can be created is as absurd as saying that matter can be destroyed. But for the, uh, the idealists, on the contrary, who see spirit as, as primary and matter as something secondary and, and dependent upon spirit, the idea of some sort of world creation and some sort of world creator flows quite naturally from the idea that spirit is prior to the world. Now, discoveries since Newton's day have, uh, have exploded the idea that the cosmos is in any way static. It has a definite history reaching up to the farthest distances and the grandest scales that we're capable of observing so far. And in a manner of speaking, astronomers can look into space and they can see that history. Um, the further that light has traveled to us, the longer ago it was emitted by the star which let off that light in some distant galaxy. So the further it is, the, the longer ago we're effectively seeing that galaxy. It's quite staggering to think that the, the most distant galaxies that you see in some of those pictures from the James Webb Telescope, um, you're seeing that light as it was emitted billions of years ago, and that galaxy as it was billions of years ago. Now, in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble, the astronomer, um, observed something quite peculiar about these distant galaxies. It seems that the further they are away from us, the redder that they appear from speed. The further they are, the faster they're receding. It is as if we are in the midst of some sort of cosmic explosion. But we've discussed this already. If you take an idea and you push it to its extreme, it becomes an absurdity. And it was a certain Georges Lemaitre um, who took this observation of Hubble and he pushed it to its extreme. 
he thought if all galaxies are moving away from each other, then if we rewind the tape far enough, all of the, that matter must have been compressed into a single point. He called it the primeval atom. And at that moment, everything was created from absolutely nothing. And we're forbidden from asking what came before it, but what caused all of this to, stuff to come into creation at that time? Lemaitre, the, the originator of this theory, he was in no doubt as to the answer to that question. Because being an ordained priest, he was sure that it was God. Now, comrades, the, the philosophical problem of infinity has always challenged men and women. Uh, repeatedly, uh, a finite limit, an imaginary finite limit, has been imposed upon the universe, either in space or time. Before Copernicus, for example, the, uh, the stars were thought to be uh, fixed to a crystal sphere roughly 200,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 Earth radii away. And one of the arguments that was thrown back at those who argued for a sun-centered universe was why don't the stars move? If they aren't fixed on a crystal sphere in the sky, then they should either appear to move as we move, the Earth moves, or else they must be enormous, stupendous distances away. And the opponents of Copernicus couldn't conceive of such distances. But of course, now we know that the stars are indeed stupendous distances away compared to the distance to our star, the sun. And even as late as the 1920s, astronomers were debating whether some of the nebulae, the smudges that we see in the sky, are they part of our galaxy, the Milky Way, or are they what they called island universes? That is to say, are they galaxies in their own right? This was a, this was a controversy in the 20s. And I'll tell you what, the vast majority of astronomers denied the possibility that there could be other galaxies other than our own, because it meant accepting that Andromeda, one of our nearest galactic neighbors, is more than 100 million light years away. Philosophically speaking, they hadn't advanced an inch since the opponents of Copernicus threw back their uh, rebuke to his uh, uh, heliocentric universe. Now, such a failure of imagination um, seems quaint to us today when we, uh, when we consider the immense advances in, in observational astronomy. But again, do not imagine that astronomers have advanced that far at all philosophically since the 1920s. In, the, in Big Bang cosmology, the, uh, the expansion that we see in this moment, in this corner of the universe, is taken to be the final word on the whole history of our cosmos. And Big Bang cosmologists, cosmologists believe that from the expansion rate of the universe, they can tell its whole history back to 0 0.0000 with 35 zeros and then a one seconds after the Big Bang. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty bold claim considering that, uh, that the accuracy with which we know the distance to our nearest galactic neighbors has a plus or five, plus or minus 5% error bar on it. The whole of the universe uh, uh, is shoehorned into a set of equations called the, uh, the, the Friedman equations, which are, which are simplified using uh, um, sweeping uh, generalizations about our universe, such as the idea that it is homogenous and not lumpy, which we see it is lumpy, clearly. I studied astrophysics at university, and the justification that is used for these simplifications is it makes the maths calculable. <laughs> That's the justification. It makes it calculable. But the problem is new observations, uh, take these mathematical abstractions all you like, but new observations will constantly impinge upon these abstractions. They will intrude upon our abstractions. And on this point, I should say that the Big Bang theory as it is today is not the Big Bang theory that existed in Lemaitre's day, because that theory did not fit into observation. But instead of questioning the theory, cosmologists have invented a host of mathematical constructions to make the facts fit the theory. Dark matter and dark energy make up 90% of the stuff in the universe. No one's ever observed them, but we know they must be real because otherwise our theories fall down. But in my personal opinion, perhaps the most uh, egregious of these mathematical inventions is something called the inflation field. We're told by cosmologists that barely a moment after the Big Bang, in which within the blink of an eye, each nanometer of space, that's roughly an atom, expanded to become 10 light years wide. Uh, Alpha Centauri is about four light years away <laughs> for a sense of scale. Each atom went to, to that scale. I, I think it's needless to say that there isn't a known mechanism for doing that. But Big Bang cosmologists are absolutely certain it happened. Otherwise, our theory would not fit the observations. This is mathematical idealism writ large. It reminds us of the phrase of the medieval scholastics. 
I believe it because it is absurd. But the further we look out into space, the further we see back in time, the more impossible it becomes to believe in this creation myth. Uh, deep space telescopes like Hubble and now the James Webb Telescope are capable of imaging galaxies as they were a few hundred million years after the supposed Big Bang. Now that sounds like a long time, a few hundred million years, but in Big Bang terms, that would make galaxies mere infants, basically. But what are we seeing at this, uh, at this time in the universe's history? We are seeing enormous metal-rich galaxies that could not have formed in the time allotted to them. And structures that are so enormous that they defy the imagination. Just last year, before the James Webb Telescope even became operational, they discovered a structure that they've called the Giant Arc. It's 9.2 billion light years away. But if we could see it from here, if we can see it with telescopes, but we, if we could see it with the unaided eye, it would cover a, a, a part of the sky 20 uh, full moons in width. It's more than 3 billion light years across. And to have formed, it would have taken an amount of time that defies the imagination, let alone the limited scope that is allowed by Big Bang cosmologists. And these observations are weighing down on the Big Bang theory today, just as Kuhn explained, and they're producing a deep disquiet in cosmology. And new devices like the James Webb Telescope will bring back data that will deepen this crisis for sure. I need to draw my uh, remarks to a close, but a, a comment about the, this, this new telescope. It was launched just 30 years after Hubble, but where Hubble orbits at 340 kilometers, it is 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. It has three times the collection area of Hubble, and some of its instruments have to be cooled to seven degrees above absolute zero. It's an incredible feat of engineering when you think about what we've put that far away from the Earth. It's a, it's a tribute to the ingenuity and the potential of our species, to be honest. But what I find even more remarkable is that Hubble was only launched 30 years after Sputnik 1, the first ever satellite in space. Now, James Webb is going to send back vast amounts of data that, that, that call to the human mind to marvel at nature and to use our ingenuity to find out how it works. And yet capitalism is plunging the vast mass of humanity into a state where the only thought that can possess them is how can I survive? In the last three years alone, the number of people suffering from acute hunger in West Africa and the Sahel region has increased from 10, 10 million to 40 million in three years. That's just one region of our planet. I, I can't think of uh, many better illustrations of the crying gulf between the potential vistas that open up before humanity with modern technology and, and productive technique now available to us and the bitter reality for the vast majority of human beings. Our duty is to fight for the material liberation of men and women from the horrors of this system. And ma materially liberating billions from the struggle for survival will also mean liberating billions of minds for art, for culture, and also for science. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic, Ben. Thank you so much. So we're gonna to move to the discussion part of the meeting now. So the first speaker that I'm gonna bring in is gonna be Daniel from the British section. Okay, thanks. I, I think one of the most common errors in science is actually an error of philosophy and not so much of science itself. Frequently, scientists tend towards what we call reductionist explanations. And they all, also, they tend to gravitate towards a, um, a narrowly quantitative approach, i.e. they ignore quality. In the main, I think scientists are attracted to, or they look for definitive and measurable proofs for things. And so they tend to think that the only real explanation for something is when it has been measured. And I think these problems are particularly acute when it comes to the science of consciousness. For example, there is a school of uh, neuro neurology, sorry, called um, eliminative materialism. One of its main proponents is called Paul Churchland. And this school's position is literally that mental states such as anger, fear, happiness, in other words, feelings, literally do not exist. And this is because they say we can find no hard or measurable evidence for them when we study the neurons that make up the brain. All we can say is that somebody's neurons fire in a certain way, and that is associated with certain observable behavior. But the feeling that the person says they have 
is an illusion. It isn't there. There's no such thing. It's just a label. This is, I think, like saying that water is not wet. In fact, there is no such thing as liquidity because all we actually have is lots and lots of individual water molecules. And since each of these water molecules is not itself wet, then there can be no wetness at all. Basically, they completely fail to understand that quality is something that emerges from the sum of the relations of these parts. Now, right now, one of the hottest celebrities, if you like, of cognitive science is Donald Hoffman. And he is guilty of one of the other errors. It's a related mistake, which is to construct a thought experiments to definitively prove something. I think, again, scientists find these thought experiments attractive because they appear to provide a simple axiomatic proof that an empirical study can never quite provide. His argument is that evolution, a result of evolution, is inevitably that all perceiving animals, such as humans, cannot possibly perceive reality as it is. To prove this, he uh, comes up with the following thought experiment, and I quote, Consider a world, you can already see it's, it's, it's just a made up scenario. Consider a world with a creature called Critter. Critter needs a resource called Stuff. If there's too little or too much stuff, Critter dies. Suppose a Critter has two perceptions, black and white. A truth seeing Critter would see as much as it can about the true nature of the world. It sees white when there's less stuff and black when there's more stuff. But a fitness-seeing critter, fitness meaning, you know, perceiving what is useful for survival, a fitness-seeing critter sees only fitness and not reality. It sees white when there is only the wrong amount of stuff, i.e. too little or too much, and black when there's just the right amount of stuff. End quote. So this he uses to allegedly prove that it is beneficial not to see reality, but instead to see something else, which is fitness, i.e. prospects for survival. Of course, all that he has done is construct a made-up scenario deliberately designed to prove what he wants. In general, animals do not see only two things, i.e. black or white. And also, they have to be able to understand a vast range of different things in order to survive in an infinite number of combinations. And of course, all the time, new things come along which might affect uh, fitness or our ability to survive. Hence, in order to survive, perception obviously must grasp the nature of reality to a, at least to sum it to a significant extent. But obviously, to understand that, you would have to study real animals in their real environment and not these made-up scenarios, which are absurdly simplistic. Now, this is perhaps a slightly extreme example, but it is quite typical of a lot of mainstream science in my experience. And uh, I actually did a search, after having read his book, I did a search on the internet for reviews, expecting that I would find a few pointing out how laughably poor his logic was. I didn't find a single bad review. And he was on the front cover of New Scientist. All of the reviews said, wow, this, this guy is so provocative. He's, he's, he's challenging our our, our our perception of reality. It's really fascinating stuff. Now, there are many people who on the left sneer at the IMT for daring to criticise many contemporary scientists and their theories. They basically say, who are you, these non-scientists, to, to have an opinion on the work of, of a peer-reviewed professional scientist? Although, by the way, that was not Engels' attitude, and many of the people saying this would would say that they follow the ideas of Engels. But I dare anyone to read some of this stuff and not think it is suitable to criticise it very harshly. Or just to have listened to Ben's excellent lead-off and, and, and not conclude that his criticisms are very sound. Now, of course, many scientists today tower above these limitations. It's not to suggest that they're all fools. And many of their theories come uh, have a lot in common with dialectical materialism, in fact. But there is a large amount of this very poor science that is really, uh, well, it's just completely unscientific. And it reflects the negative effects of competition and the marketplace in academia, the limitations of bourgeois philosophy, which is mechanistic, individualistic, 
and the you know the sort of um the way in which a lot of science has been compartmentalized into different disciplines rather than looking at the interconnected nature of reality and uh, the also i would say it reflects the individualistic mentality of the petty bourgeoisie since most of these scientists are petty bourgeois but of course in a socialist society those constraints from the marketplace would be removed and i think science would go through an enormous flourishing uh, on a, onto a higher level, especially armed with the best ideas of Marxist philosophy, the method of Marxist philosophy. Thank you very much for that contribution, Daniel. Um, so the next person to speak will be Ilya from Greece. So comrades, science has the task of uncovering the hidden laws operating in different levels of reality. Many scientists to do this, uh, they think that they don't need any kind of philosophy. They think they only need the scientific method. But scientists necessarily approach their subject matter with certain assumptions. Behind every hypothesis, there are always many assumptions, and not all of them are derived from science. Many times they are derived from the philosophical outlook of the researcher. So philosophy is uh, clearly important for science. Of course, uh, the role of philosophy does not and cannot replace the work of science, but can give science a guidance, a method. Uh, if it is the wrong philosophical approach, it can lead scientific thoughts in blind alley. And this is uh, many times the case. I would like to talk about one such example. There are, of course, many others. The comrades have already talked about some of them. And this is uh, reductionism. Reductionism has been and still remains the dominant mode of analysis of the physical and biological world. It is based on the false assumption that the world is a collection of fixed qualities and categories, and that they are, in order to understand the whole, you must just add up the parts. So the main task of science is to analyze the parts, which is of course progressive, but then just put them back together like a machine, and that will be enough to understand the whole system, which is false. Because this approach does not correspond to how the, the universe really works. If we base ourselves on dialectical materialism, we will immediately uh, dismiss the reductionist approach as a method of understanding everything. One of the basic laws of dialectics is the transformation of quantity into quality. The universe is in reality a huge laboratory of constant such transformations. And this uh, universal law can be applied to every realm of reality. From this law alone, we can assume that the whole in every system is qualitatively different than the parts. The whole has new qualities that do not exist in the level of the parts. In systems theory, this has been described as emergent properties of a system. For example, water has the quality of wetness, but this quality does not exist in uh, isolated molecules of water. Moreover, water can change its quality as temperature, temperature changes. From liquid can become solid or vapor. Also, the transition of, from one uh, from quantity to quality is not uh, gradual, but constant. It is uh, immediate. When we reach a critical point, you have a quick change from quantity to quality. One of the tasks of science is to find those critical points when quantity becomes quality. And, al and also, what is this new quality? What are the laws and properties that arise on that level that does not diminish the need to examine the parts, of course? On the contrary, that is necessary. It just removes the false assumption that from the parts only you can understand them. In living organisms, for example, it's almost self-evident. You cannot explain the behavior of a rabbit by knowing how the organs of the rabbit work. And you cannot explain how the organs work by knowing how the individual cells work. In biology, we had a rapid growth of molecular biology in the 1950s, which led to the revolutionary uh, discovery and the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003. But this huge progress in science uh, came with the baggage of reduction. If you know all the parts, we will explain all the biological processes. This led to dead ends in many levels, as many scientists now are forced to admit. In 2014, a prominent cancer researcher named Robert Winberg admitted that uh, in a paper that uh, the current paradigm of cancer research, which of course is a reductionist paradigm, has ultimately failed to unravel the complexity of this set of reduction is not only led to dead ends, but also reactionary theories like the genetic reductionism, which tries to understand human behavior and social phenomena uh, from the point of view of the genes. So, so there must be a gene for uh, poverty, there must be a gene for uh, crim criminal activity, etc. This reaction theory, of course, was embraced by the right wing because it put the blame on the individual and not the system as a whole. A small minority of biologists uh, combated uh, this approach. Not by chance, many of them had a different philosophical approach, 
one important such biologist was the recent deceased uh, Richard de Levodin, who was openly a Marxist and uh, applied dialectical materialism, making huge uh, progress in uh, areas of biology, different areas of biology. The cases of the inability of uh, reductions to explain complicated uh, phenomena are mounting. So a new branch of biology started uh, developing to give answers, and it's called uh, systems biology. This branch of biology was affected by both, uh, uh, both from systems theory and chaos theory, both of which are a confirm confirmation of uh, dialectical materialism. In short, uh, it says that you cannot explain the, the whole system from the parts. At every level of a biological system, you have new properties called emergent properties. And it also, uh, this branch of biology examines the phenomenon in its, in its motion, not static, which is a confirmation of uh, dialectical material. So to sum up, uh, comrades, sooner or later, science must find the answers underlying, the, find the laws underlying every phenomenon. If our theory or, or method of analysis is wrong, it will eventually be replaced. The problem is that the wrong philosophy and method is costing science many years of mistakes. Capitalism has become now an enormous obstacle in the uh, development of science. One of the reasons is the limitations of the philosophical approach, the capitalist philosophical approach. It is uh, the duty of every progressive scientist to wage an ideological war against those ideas. And finally, uh, in, uh, when the capitalist system will be overthrown, those ideas will, com will be completely swiped out. And in socialism, scientific thought will be freed from the cycles of empiricism, formal logic, and idealism, and will make leaps and bounds forward that we cannot even think. Thank you very much for that great contribution, Ilya. So just before I bring in the next speaker, um, if you are interested in learning more about Marxist ideas, then I encourage you to subscribe to the theoretical magazine of the IMT, um, which is called the In Defense of Marxism magazine. And it's published in many languages, including Swedish, German, Russian and Spanish. And you can subscribe at marxist.com forward slash magazine. So the next speaker that I will bring in is John. Um, he's from Spain. Um, well, hello, everyone from the Basque country in the north of Spain. Uh, I am. I have to say that I am very proud to see so many people from so many countries gathered to talk and listen about science and communism. In its beginnings, capitalism was a leap forward for humanity. Uh, it was certainly a progressive phenomenon which broke the chains of feudalism. Uh, group workers in work centers with machinery, production chains, economy of scale, uh, it broke the railroad, telegraph, uh, etc. Uh, then uh, fierce competition promote investment and scientific improvement. But at Marx and Engels predict, uh, capitalism tends to monopolies, and we can now see it. Uh, a few co big companies share the market, especially in science and technology. Uh, for example, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Nowadays, there is hardly any interest in big investments, in big improvements. And those that uh, exist are to increase private profit margins, never focus on the interests of humanity. Uh, we can see how electric, for example, electric battery patents are kept by the oil giants. Uh, and we see how technologies such as uh, blockchain are used to create a thousand and one junk cryptocurrencies, which instead of making the banks disappear, as they promised, uh, they have created new and much worse ones, uh, as well as scams that uh, ruin the, pu the poor and enrich the, the usual ones. However, uh, blockchain has, uh, has such is a good technology. It will give us the ability in a socialist society, for example, to have absolute control of all accounts, transactions, production chains, uh, and so on in a transparent and in a public way, eliminating bureaucracy and corruption. Precisely, bureaucracy and corruption were one of the most important reasons why the USSR fell. Therefore, we, we can see that we already have the technology to help prevent that from happening again. Uh, however, science and technology are hugely corrupt under capitalism. You cannot build an utopia inside uh, capitalism. In another example, uh, I have to say that, for example, capitalism uh, proves us right and paves the way for socialism, centralization and democratization of resources. 
uh, for example, another example of this can be seen with uh, cloud computing. Uh, we have gone from each company having to create and maintain its own computing resources with the cost and limitation that this entails to the existence of monopolies such as I said earlier, uh, has Amazon with its Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft with uh, Azure, and Google with its uh, Google Cloud, where huge amounts of computing resources are hosted on demand. In a socialist society, for example, we could already have computer services on demand in a centralized cloud so that anyone could uh, access them in a democratic and, let's say, free way. Uh, a socialist and harmonious control of these resources would, uh, would allow them to be distributed equally and reasonably, avoiding the unnecessary waste and pollution that currently happens with these services under capitalism. So again, we can see that we already have technology to, to create uh, socialism and to solve the problems uh, of capitalism. I could go on for hours and hours giving more and more examples, but I don't, I don't have uh, enough time today. So comrades, uh, as we have seen during these days, I think it is clear. I think that uh, science, uh, philosophy and history can prove us right. And uh, even more, uh, the present is for sure also proving us right. It is just a matter of seeing how many people are not, not only here today, but uh, during these days to talk uh, not only about science, but essentially about communism. Uh, we are living through a historic turning point, and in only, let's say, 10, uh, 20 years, we, the young people, are living through countless wars and revolutions. One of them, uh, one of those wars, is right now in the heart of Europe, in Ukraine. Uh, and also several economic crises and even a pandemic. So people are saying right now enough is enough. Um, people are deciding to fight. But comrades, uh, without an organization, the struggles, the struggle goes nowhere. Therefore, comrades who actually who they do not belong yet to an organization, I invite you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart to do so in the International Marxist Tendency. In my opinion, there is no other organization that take as much care of theory as ours without limiting itself to being, let's say, a book club for retired people, with all my respect for, for these people. But, uh, you know, some comrades who have unfortunately Suffer the oppression of the police and other dogs of the state know what I am talking about. Two minutes left. Uh, so, comrades, they will not steal our future. It will be socialist, socialist, or it will simply not be. So, comrades, uh, let's join the international Marxist tendency and long life communism and long life the international Marxist tendency. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention. Um, so we'll move now to the last speaker for this session, and that will be Pascal, and he is um, from the British section of the International Marxist Tendency. Hey, comrades. Um, in 1966, the American science, science journalist John Hogan wrote a rather provocative book titled The End of Science. In it, he says the following. These are trying times for truth seekers. The scientific enterprise is threatened by technophobes, uh, animal rights activists, religious fundamentalists, and most importantly, stingy politicians. Social, political, and economic constraints will make it more difficult to practice science, and pure science in particular, in the future. Hogan's main thesis is that, well, the golden age of science is behind us, that most things which we can hope to discover have been discovered, and that all that remains for us is to apply our generally correct fundamental ideas to new practical problems. Other comrades have already touched on this idea, and this is not the place to deal extensively with Hogan's book. But there is no doubt that he puts his finger on a general unease surrounding the scientific enterprise. After all, it has been a century since the last truly great, science, truly great breakthroughs in fundamental science. Quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity, upon which most of modern physics and much of modern technology rest. Theoretical physics, which was once regarded with a general sense of awe, now evokes rather a general sense of bemusement. Um, because scientists are paid good money to develop grand unified theories of the world which require 10 or 11 dimensions to work, and which have so far not made a single correct experimental prediction. 
Ben and Daniel have already gone into a lot of detail on these, you know, the follies of idealism in science. At the same time, experimental science is facing a replication crisis. For example, a few years ago, a biotechnology company tried to replicate the results of 53 landmark cancer studies. Now, while this is being translated, have a guess in how many cases they succeeded. The answer is six, six out of 53, or a little more than 10%. And science seems completely incapable of dealing with the greatest threat of our time, climate change. The capitalist system, the same system which once revolutionized science, this system which put it on a materialist basis and which used it as a battering ram against all the privileges of the church and the feudal order, this is what is now holding science back tremendously. And to understand this, we have to understand that the capitalists have never invested in science uh, for its own sake or because it is beautiful or inspiring. They did so because it was profitable. In the medical sciences, for example, this means that antibiotics simply aren't being researched anymore. And pharmaceutical companies, which make billions in profits every year, are quite honest about why. It is simply less profitable to cure a patient than to develop, say, a lifestyle drug that they can be sold for years. This is causing a crisis of antibiotic resistance, which the World Health Organization considers one of the greatest problems of our time. More generally, science allowed the capitalists to revolutionize production. Whoever based their, their company, their production, on the most advanced science would have an advantage over their competitors and rake in uh, super profits. Today, the capitalists have neither the interest nor the means to use science in this way anymore. They don't want to revolutionize production because there is already massive overproduction. This is the root of the crisis we are currently in. And because of this same crisis, they cannot invest in science in the way they used to. Quite the opposite, science budgets are being cut everywhere. In the USA, which is still the largest economy in the world, funding for fundamental science declined from 40 to 30 billion by 25% uh, in the span of only five years last decade. And this means that scientists have to spend more time and effort trying to justify the research than they actually spend doing research. This leads to completely perverse incentives. These days, to make a living out of science, it's not that important that you actually do good research. It's more important that you have flashy results published in respected journals and ideally several times a year. So scientists who also have less money to properly double check the results are incentivized to cut corners, to fudge the results or even to commit outright fraud. As a result of the same pressures, research has become more short term in its outlook. This is a problem because the greatest breakthroughs may take years or even decades. Peter Higgs, who you might know for predicting the Higgs boson decades before it was discovered experimentally, has said on this that he would not be regarded, I quote, not be regarded as productive enough by today's universities and funding bodies. This is a man who's won the Nobel Prize recently. He takes this to, to its logical conclusion and explains that he doubts that similar breakthroughs could be achieved in today's academic culture. Now, I don't want you to leave you with quite as bleak a picture. John Horgan, whose quote I started with, is a pessimist. He is only almost correct that there will be no more scientific breakthroughs because he does not have the perspective of the socialist revolution. And so he forgets the most important bit. There will be no more scientific breakthroughs as long as capitalism is allowed to continue to weigh down human spirit and human effort. So if you want to see science prosper, and more importantly, if you want, want its fruits to be enjoyed by all, then there's only one thing you can do. Get involved in the struggle to overthrow this decrepit system and fight for socialism. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pascal. And thank you to all of the speakers who have come in on the discussion. You've all given us lots to think about and to go and read more about. Um, and on that note, if you would like to read more about the topic that's been discussed today about dialectics and about science, um, then I would direct you to our bookshop, Well Read Books, which you can find at www.wellread.com dash books.com and there are two books that you'll find there that I would particularly recommend. One is Reason and Revolt by Ted Grant and Alan Woods um, and the other one is Dialectics of Nature by Frederick Engels which are both fantastic to deepen and develop your knowledge. Um, so we'll now go to Ben who is going to uh, sort of summarise and add comments on the discussion as we've had today. Thank you very much Tash and um, thank you to all the comrades. It's uh... <laughs> It's, it's an enormous task to come back on such a wide ranging uh, discussion, but I'll do my best. Um, so I, I wanted to start by talking about um, something that Ilias and I think Ilias and Dan touched upon a, a similar thing. And that's where you end up when you have a lack of dialectics uh, in, in, in philosophical terms uh, as, a, as a scientist, where you can end up. Because of course, all of the, the, the description of um, the Darwinian evolution and, and the various uh, discoveries about stellar history, the history of our Earth, geology, these, these confirm dialectics. But, you know, Darwin had never read Hegel. Um, you, you know, the, uh, Lyle had never read Hegel. These, these, great, these great scientists, um, 
achieve, achieve this despite their lack of philosophical training. And I think particularly when we get to those sciences which are closer to the vital interests of the capitalist class, a lack of philosophy can become fatal. In, in a mood of, uh, of, of, of creeping mysticism and despair, fields like, uh, like neuroscience, like, uh, like biology, with all of the racism and everything, all of the biological, race, you know, so-called scientific justifications for racism, all of these, these fields can be, can be affected by the, the moods in society. All, the, all these prejudices can find their way in, in, uh, uh, into the sciences, can be reflected in the sciences. And, and uh, Daniel and uh, Ilias gave us some examples of how uh, yeah, lack of philosophy um, can lead, uh, lead scientists to draw incorrect conclusions, particularly the problem, the question of reductionism in the sciences. Well, Daniel talked about this, uh, mentioned that some quotes and uh, points by this, this idiot who claims that uh, emotions don't exist because when you look at a neuron under a microscope, you don't see it with a sad face or an angry face. Uh, so presumably then, if all of our brain is, is neurons and chemicals, um, then there's no such thing as sadness or happiness or anything. I said before, you know, don't imagine that scientists today have taken a step forward since the 17th century. You know, this is the same philosophy put forward by Descartes, his, his idea that animals are mere mechanisms. And to, to solve the problem of consciousness, he had to... He had to appeal to another realm, to a god or something. This is the problem with the mechanistic uh, worldview. Because no matter how you twist and turn the parts in their isolation, you will never find the qualities that define the whole. Because the whole is more than the sum of its parts, as Ilias very well put it. Quantity expresses itself in quality uh, in, in an immediate sense. You know, you have this, this emergence of, uh, of, of the properties of the whole from its parts. And many neuroscientists have been led into a complete, complete wilderness of confusion because they don't understand this dialectical outlook. For example, I think his name is David Chalmers. This, um, he's, this, uh, he's, this neuro he's this philosophy guy in uh, the University of Arizona. And every year in the University of Arizona, they put on this, uh, this conference of consciousness. And they, they get leading um, philosophers. They get leading neuroscientists, even... Um, Roger Penrose, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, he, he, he regularly has attended. And this is put on by the University of Arizona. And all these people come with their quack theories of uh, consciousness. And alongside them, you have sessions being put on by mystics on uh, meditation, yoga, and this sort of stuff. <laughs> it's, this is, these, these are the best minds uh, of, 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 of you know, uh, academia today. Um, and uh, we see how this mysticism and this reductionism actually really converge in some of the wacky ideas that these, uh, these theorists of consciousness come out with. One of their theories of, of consciousness is that consciousness is basically a property of matter. It's, uh, it's, it's the degree to which matter organized can, uh, can integrate information. You can integrate a lot of information in a brain, so it's very conscious. But Everything else can also integrate information. So everything else is a little bit conscious. A stone is a bit conscious. A molecule is a bit conscious. They actually, like they actually believe this stuff. It's, it's where you get from the reductionist approach that the whole is nothing more than the sum of its parts. You can turn around a neuron or a stone and find a little bit of consciousness in it. And there are, there are other theories that come out of this same conference. Um, Roger Penrose has a, has a pet theory as well. On the question of free will, what gives us free will? For Penrose, the idea that uh, the world is, is determined by a deterministic necessity is incompatible, completely incompatible with, with free will. And so he proposes that consciousness comes from these nanotubes in our neurons because they're of such a small size that you can have quantum tunneling across them. And so accident obviously predominates at the level of the, the, the quantum level. And therefore, this is presumably where consciousness comes to us from some quantum realm. It's, uh, it, it comes from a complete inability to understand the relationship between accident and necessity. We as Marxists understand that accident and necessity, they're not opposites. They're two sides of the same, uh, same coin. Accident appears to, to predominate at the scale of the, the quantum scale, but that can resolve itself into, into regular Newtonian motion at the macro scale. With its, uh, with its apparent iron necessity. Take each of the molecules in, uh, well, in this room that I'm sat in here and uh, examine them. You could uh, imagine them as more or less uh, moving around according to Newton's laws randomly and their motion would appear accidental. Um, but take enough of those molecules and uh, you have 
the necessary laws of thermodynamics, the ideal gas equation, whether an individual uh, molecule will hit the wall of a chamber of a piston or not, and at what speed is, is essentially random from the point of view of that molecule. But taken from a bulk perspective, all of the molecules taken together will apply a very specific pressure at a certain temperature with a certain energy. Accident expresses itself through necessity, as we've often explained. This is a, this is, this is a complete closed book to people like uh, the Nobel Prize winning Roger Penrose. And what gives us the sensation of freedom is precisely our ability to understand the laws of nature and therefore to bend them to our will. Now, on, on Penrose, uh, there's a certain, um, I could make a, a connection to some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, idealist nonsense that comes out of quantum mechanics. I said very little about that in this talk, but I don't have time to talk about that. So I'm going to cut that out entirely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to move on a little bit. So apologies for that. But yes, to, to move on to some of the things that Ilias was, uh, was talking about, the, um, the idea of uh, biological reductionism. Well, comrades have probably all come across the same prejudice on every paper sale about uh, biological reductionism that Ilias was talking about. Whenever you're, you're you know, selling our literature, talking to friends and family, I'm sure there has been an occasion where every socialist has been answered with the following answer to their arguments. Uh, well, socialism sounds very nice, but have you stopped to consider human nature? The implication expresses a, 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 a reductionist philosophical prejudice. We, we see war, we see uh, selfishness, greed, all of this sort of stuff in, uh, in this society all around us. And this society is nothing more than the sum of its parts, the individuals that make it up. And therefore, a tendency towards violence, greed, selfishness, and I might add racism, sexism, these are all innate qualities of us as individuals. It's a static, undialectical attitude towards human nature that it is this inherent thing that is uh, a part of our essence. And that our essence as individuals is itself nothing more than the expression of our genes. Selfishness is, is inscribed in our genes. Uh, racism, sexism, you get, you get this prejudice expressed on a paper sale. Um, or to your friends or workmates, but some scientists have actually refined this into theory, into scientific theory. You have ev um, uh, so-called evolutionary psychology, sociobiology, scientists like E.O. Wilson. In the case of Wilson, he, he studied ants and uh, discovered that they have a certain apparently pre-programmed behavior to, to act in a certain way in their ant society. He extended this to explain all of the social phenomena that we see in human society can pre be presumably reduced to some sort of genetic uh, predisposition to this social behavior. This was expressed by Richard Dawkins in his idea of a, of a selfish gene that simply wants to reproduce itself and we are merely biological vessels for the reproduction of the gene. Uh, it's this, these are the sort of simplifications that uh, Daniel was talking about with his critters that are looking for stuff in the world arbitrary abstract constructions which reality is forced into they are taken for reality in reality uh, human development and the way that we exist as human beings is, is far more complex than merely that we are the expression of our genes the the, the human genome uh, project that Ilias mentioned uh, uncovered that we only actually have about 100,000 genes most of our DNA is is non-coding so-called junk DNA but uh, uh, They've recently, well, not recently, but in, in, re in more or less recent years, discovered genetic diseases which are associated with this non-coding DNA. If, these, uh, if this DNA is not coding for the production of proteins or, or whatever else, then it is merely forming the environment for those genes that do code for uh, uh, certain things in, uh, uh, with, within our cells. And so clearly it's an interaction of the genes and their environment, which includes junk DNA, it includes the hormones, the, 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 the situation, the chemical situation within, within the womb at each stage of life. It's, there's a dialectical interaction between our genes and its environment and our organism uh, as a whole, which determines our, our development. It's impossible to reduce human development to DNA and genes. And in fact, they've, uh, they, they've shown that uh, certain characteristics from an organism can be inherited epigenetically, that is to say, not through our not through our genes, but through uh, certain changes within those genes, how they are switched off and on during life. I, I read about a very cruel experiment on mice in which the mice were exposed to the smell of cherry blossom. 
and they were then electrocuted and they became afraid of cherry blossom smell. And uh, that fear of cherry blossom was actually passed down for two generations, which I find fascinating. Their, their, their children and their grandchildren were also afraid of the smell of cherry blossom. Behaviour which, of course, cannot be explained by the genes, but by epigenetic mechanisms. Um, comrades John and Pascal briefly um, um, talked um, very well about the, uh, the impasse of capitalism and the potential of the product that, uh, that exists in technology, in science, to, to set humanity free. Um, uh, John used the example of blockchain and IT technology. I just want to mention uh, the example of uh, uh, fusion technology, which uh, is, is not a, a silver bullet for climate change, but uh, it's an important area of active research. For the last 20 years, uh, less than $500 million a year has been spent on this research, which could have, could have had an enormous impact on climate change. That's less than is spent on uh, research and development of new disposable razors each year. Um, and most of that funding actually comes um, as an aside to uh, the, the work that is done by those research centers in maintaining nuclear weapon stockpiles. Now, pa Pascal mentioned all of the other ways besides the philosophical aspect, which I focused on, that science is mired in the crisis of capitalism. I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the suffering that the vast mass of humanity is, is, uh, is being plunged into. But under class society, the vast masses, the, the masses have always suffered. The, the, the historical justification of any class society, however, has been that at the expense of the masses, there has still been progress. Uh, Jordi talked yesterday about the horrors of the Spanish conquest. Nevertheless, capitalism at that stage was taking humanity forward as a whole. It was developing the productive forces, developing science. Can we say that now with the replication, replication crisis, the publish or perish uh, situation in universities. Can this system fundamentally justify its existence, justify the suffering of the masses that, uh, that it enforces upon them? I, I'm going to finish with this, with this quote um, because I, I, I really like it. Um, it's from Hegel and uh, I think it, it, it summarizes the point of, uh, of, of this, this lead off. He says, our youth has been persuaded that they possess the truth without further ado. In particular, it's been said in this context that all adults are wooden and fossilized and immersed in untruth. The dawn has appeared to the young people, so they say, but the older world is stuck in the muddle and morass of the everyday. The older generation does indeed pin its hopes on the young, for it is they who are supposed to keep the world and science advancing. But this hope is conferred upon the young only in so far as they do not remain as they are but take on the bitter labor of the spirit. We are building a party of the youth, a party of the future, but we can only achieve what we can achieve if we precisely do what Hegel says, to take on what he describes as the bitter labor of the spirit, to really conquer dialectics, to be able to understand the dialectic in nature and in society and recognize it where it appears, so that we're theoretically armed for the challenges that face us in the struggle to overthrow capitalism. Thank you, comrades.